On today's episode, we're going to talk about what brand new real estate agents should expect from their broker, the ban that some people in the real estate industry want to put on door knocking, and a recent decision the government just made to penalize home buyers with good credit while rewarding those with bad credit. So real quick before we jump into today's episode, if you're a real estate agent, you want to build a listing-based real estate sales business, but you're not getting the coaching, you're not getting the training that you currently need, I'm going to put a link in the show notes, in the description, right underneath this video for you to find out more about my Listing Agent Academy. You can get all the details and then decide if working together at this time makes sense or not. So with that said, let's jump into today's episode. All right, so let's start off today's episode by talking about a very, very important topic and a question that I often get from brand new real estate agents that find themselves frustrated after they get in the business because they just feel as though they're not getting the support, the training, the coaching that they thought they would get from their broker. And I want to talk about this in great details. And I and I'm give you really two ways to look at this. And so I got a comment on one of the recent videos on YouTube, and it was a great question. And here's what the agent said. He said, hey, man, I have a question and really need help. I'm a new real estate agent, and I don't really get much broker support or training. I'm learning from you more than him. And as a result, should I find another broker? Also, is my broker supposed to go over things like how to deal with confrontation, how to go on listing appointments, how to become better prepared so that I can be an agent that's well-informed? I feel like I wouldn't really know what to do even if I got a listing or had to go on an, a listing appointment. Well, unfortunately, again, that is just the question that I get all too often from new real estate agents. Now, I want to set this up by helping those that are new to real estate or are thinking about getting into real estate as a, as a career, why many new real estate agents feel this way about their broker. What I am about to say is not a defense for brokers because it shouldn't be this way. However, there was a recent article that Jeff Glover just put out on Inman. Shout out to you, Jeff. And he talked about why the agent count model doesn't work. And let me explain. Most brokerage business models, are the only way that they succeed is by having a large agent count, by having tons and tons of agents. Because the margins are so thin running a brokerage. I should know. I started one from scratch. And because those margins are so razor thin, the only way that brokerage firm actually makes it and stays in business, let alone become profitable in a successful business, is by having hundreds and hundreds of agents. And just depending on how the business model is set up, some brokerages need more agents than others. If you look at that concept right there alone, it becomes very difficult for that broker or the people on that broker's team to really supply the in-depth, hands-on training and coaching that a new agent needs to succeed in this business. It just doesn't, it doesn't allow for that to occur. And so that's why I've said to I've said it many times on the channel. This is the the advice that I give is the same thing that I did, which is I started on a real estate team. Because unlike the real estate brokerage that has to have a ton of agents to succeed, the real estate team typically is a lot more close knit because they have a lot less people on them than that of a brokerage. And so my first thought is goes back to what I've always said that I will continue to say, that what probably makes the most sense for a brand new real estate agent 
is not to find themselves going to a large brokerage firm where they may get lost in the shuffle. It probably makes more sense for them to go on a real estate team where they will have a culture, where they will have a team environment, where they will get hands-on training, hands-on coaching. They'll be held accountable. And this, in my opinion, is how new agents should start in the business. And then only after they understand what it is that they're doing to go out there and service buyers and service sellers at the highest level, should they consider going off on their own. Now, the argument to that is, okay, well, some agents don't want to go on a team because the team maybe has a higher commission split than that of a real estate brokerage. Although true, 0% or, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, 100% of zero is still zero, right? That's the way I look at it. If I was a brand new agent all over again, I wouldn't change anything. I would be willing to give up more on a commission split because it's not about how much you generate necessarily. It has more to do with how much you net. In other words, if if you had the choice right now to go to a real estate brokerage and get 100% of your commission and that commission yielded at the end of the year $25,000 in income or... You could go to a real estate team and you get 50% of the commission, but as a result of more training, coaching, education, accountability, environment, culture, leadership, you made $175,000 in taxable income versus the $25,000. Which one would be better for you? It's the obvious choice. And so this isn't an... uh, This isn't a promotion for teams in a beat up the broker session, but quite frankly, for for new real estate agents, it just doesn't set up well for them to go to a big boxed brokerage. Some brokers do a better job than others, but the amount of handholding that a new real estate agent needs, and I just made a video about this on the podcast earlier this week about how the future of our profession of real estate agents is at risk. Well, one of the things to combat that risk is how we're bringing people into the industry. And how we bring people into the industry should be different than how it is today. Not not only is the failure rate at almost 90% of agents in their first two years, but you have so many agents like the one that I just outlined today that are struggling because they're not getting the support from their broker and the broker not set up to give that level of support because it virtually makes the business model impossible to deliver the the in-depth training and coaching. The broker can never, they can never do it. They couldn't afford to do it. They don't have the bandwidth to do it like a team does because the margins are so much bigger. And so removing the emotion, removing the the theory behind or the the thought of, should I join a brokerage? Is it better to go solo? Is it better to join a team? Well, removing the emotion from that, the logic is it absolutely makes sense for a new real estate agent to first join a team because the business model of a team is set up there interest is set up to help that real estate agent to succeed. Because the only way that that team leader generates revenue is by the success of his or her agents. And so a new agent will can expect a lot more in-depth training versus the broker who says, listen, my model is quite the opposite. I have to go super wide, not super deep. I've got to recruit all the time. I have to recruit and hope agents make it. And we spend very little time going deep with one agent. I got to hire the masses because that's the only way that this business model works. Furthermore, 
when you look past that, this isn't now, now let me give the other side of this. This, some brokers are great, but in my experience, not only are the business models for most brokerages not set up to help agents really reach their highest potential, but here's the other big issue. And I mean this with the most, with, I don't mean to be disrespectful to any broker in particular. I'm just seeing, this is what I see, is that most broker managers, most people that own brokerages aren't equipped to coach an agent into high production. Why? Because they themselves have never succeeded in selling real estate at a high, high level. So not only do they have a business model that doesn't support going deep with an agent to help an agent succeed, but even if it did, in my experience, most, not all, okay? So I can just hear the comments now. Brandon, this is total bullshit. My broker sells 150 houses a year. I understand. I understand. Some brokers are different. I own a brokerage and I have a successful real estate sales business. Later on the show, I'm going to bring somebody on that also is a broker owner, but he's selling 100 houses a year himself. That isn't the norm. It's the 80-20 principle, right? 80% of these people that are running these brokerages have not, in fact, succeeded themselves in personal real estate sales. And so that's the other thing that doesn't set up well for new real estate agents going to join these big brokerage firms. Unlike most team leaders, so if you look at the 80-20 principle with teams, the vast majority of team leaders, on the contrary, have actually succeeded in selling real estate in high volume in personal production. So now, when you look at those two arguments, you start it starts to become very, very clear that the debate isn't, isn't one that is even questionable that for a brand new real estate agent, and I would love to have someone debate this with me, but for a brand new real estate agent, I just don't see a world where it doesn't make sense for him or her to go join a team for their first year or two or three in the business, learning the business from someone who has walked the walk, succeeded themselves, first and foremost, and has a business model that supports that new real estate agent succeeding. All right, so joining me now, we've got one of the country's, I would say, top door-knocking real estate agents, Dwayne Richens. Dwayne, appreciate you jumping on with us this morning. Hey, thanks for having me back, Brandon. Yeah, absolutely. So, for context, before we jump into this recent article that just got released, which I think is um, pretty controversial. And before we get into that, you've been door knocking pretty much your entire career. You've had a lot of success door knocking in real estate sales as well as other industry. But for context, for people listening to this, Dwayne, how much business have you done door knocking in real estate sales? Oh my gosh, millions. I mean, for before I started in real estate, uh, the company I was working for, Vivint Home Security, I made the company over fifty million dollars in sales alone. Wow. So yeah, so I've how got many? A... I'm sorry. Go ahead. I said I've got a ton of experience on that. I've I've you know I've pounded probably fifty to a hundred thousand doors. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So you think that you've knocked on between fifty and a hundred thousand individual doors? Is that right? That's right. Yep. In, yeah. In so, all. Of... Yeah. Well, that's why I thought that there'd probably be nobody better to have this discussion because I'm curious to kind of get your thoughts. And here's, wh here's what the, the article had to say. This was an article that was released earlier this week, and I wanted to get your feedback and kind of how you're thinking about this. But the article reads, um, reads this, that, that there was essentially it's time to retire door knocking once and for all. And the article reads, Dwayne, a teenager was shot for being at the wrong address. Telling agents to door knock for new business is dated advice, and it could lead to be deadly. 
It's time to stop door knocking. In the past seven days, two people have been shot by homeowners simply for being at the wrong address. One was a 16-year-old teenager who went to pick up his brothers, knocked on the wrong door, and was shot twice by the homeowner. The other was a 20-year-old woman who got lost, went to the wrong house, who was trying to find a friend's home. Going to people's properties is dangerous. These days, telling your agents to knock on doors for new business isn't just dated advice, but it could also be a deadly endeavor. So, Dwayne, your thoughts on this recent article? I mean, first of all, my heart goes out to those families that had, you know, the accidents happen from people, in my opinion, that just did have no right to, to shoot someone for no reason, right? Um, but I think that's ludicrous, honestly, as far as telling agents not to go knock on doors. It is by far the very best way to pick up business face to face. It's not dangerous. Brandon, I've knocked in Chicago in Section 8 housing. I've knocked in Alabama. I've locked, I've knocked in Missouri itself. That's where the shooting happened. Um, I've knocked in East Palo Alto in areas that were very dangerous, right? I was selling security systems. You didn't go where there was no crime. Mm. We went where there was crime. And um, even for real estate, you guys, it's just a matter of being smart with what you're doing. Um, it, the time that you're knocking, I, I don't think there's any risk whatsoever in knocking on doors to get business. So let me ask you this. So in in your time in knocking doors, fifty to one hundred thousand dollars, or fifty to one hundred thousand doors, have you en- ever encountered any dangerous situations? No, I mean th- there was a time in, in in Palo Alto, East Palo Alto, where and this was before I even got on doors. There was a low rided vehicle that kept following around. I was driving a BMW, right? I park and four individuals jump out of the car and started coming up to me. I just ran up to a door and started knocking on it. That actually saved my life. Mm. And started pounding on the door. Um, the homeowner didn't even answer, but they jumped back in their car and drove off. But that could happen to anybody. That I wasn't even out knocking doors at that point, but door knocking saved my life at that point. I could have been robbed, I could have been hurt. Um, but needless to say, no, I've never had an experience where I have felt uncomfortable or felt like I was in danger at all while I was knocking doors. So where does safety come in in your mindset, right? I mean, as a leader in the industry, you uh, advocate as door knocking as being a, a great way to generate business, and it has proven to be that way. I think that when when things like this this article get released, I think it brings a whole new maybe awareness to the real estate agent community to maybe say, well, wow, we, we haven't really thought about it that way because there's been all kinds of stories, Dwayne, as you know, about how dangerous our business can be. I mean, dealing with the public in general, you don't know what you are going to find in dealing with, with the public. I guess, how do you see that? I mean, for agents that's, that agree, that say, I'm gonna go door knock, um, I think you said there's there's, you don't believe that the risk is there. Certainly, there's the dealing with the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen, right? So do, do you think that uh, or where does safety come into play when agents do want to door knock, in, in your opinion? Well, you know, when I say safety is there's no, there's no risk. There's always risk. You take an individual that meets someone at a, at a vacant house that they've never met before and they go in that home, there's risk there. But I think there's less risk knocking on a door when you have a full subdivision of people looking out their windows and know that you're there. Um, but, but I think you've always got to take safety precautions. So it's, you know, if you're packing mace for, as a female, um, that's a great thing. And you should do that regardless if you're door knocking or if you're not door knocking. I don't think there's any special precautions you should take. Um, we have had some females that have knocked doors for me or been in my coaching programs that I'm like, hey, buddy up. Don't knock together, but one knock across the street from the other. And if you're not knocking, you know, with somebody, let people know where you're at. Hey, I'm headed over to this street tonight. Let your spouse, let your your coworker know, just like you would when you're going to meet a client for the first time you've never met at a home that may be vacant. You know, these are the type of precautions you're going to take regardless if it's door knocking or if you're just being a general real estate agent. Yeah, going going to show a house to a stranger 
potentially has the same, you know, potential threat. That's kind of your argument, right? You're you're saying, listen, yep. if you get a call on a, on one of your listings or you get a call to go show a property for a buyer, an agent takes the same risk going to meet that stranger at that house as they would door knocking. I love the fact that you said to maybe buddy up because that's what I was going to ask you. You know, have you guys messed around with, hey, let's just go together. Maybe not only from a safety perspective, but maybe agents can muster up the courage if they're not by themselves, right? So what's your experience with actually knocking with a buddy? So door knocking together makes it a lot harder because number one, you've got to earn the trust of the person in front of you. So if you've got two people standing there, you're knocking at the door, they're like, yeah, man, this is sketchy. I've got two adult males. I've got, you know, women, honestly, women have it way better than men do because they gain instant credibility faster. Men were portrayed as, hey, these guys are here to rob us. Uh, they just mm. don't trust in the house. So it takes a lot more. And one thing that I've learned going door to door is I don't try to get in the house. I let them invite me in. And one of the rules with door to door sales is they try to, you know, a lot of salesmen want to get in the home because once they're in the house, the comfort level goes up and their skepticism level drops. Now, I've never been that way, even selling alarms. I would want them to invite me in. I would try to close and do paperwork on the doorstep until I'm invited in. It's the same way with, with real estate. I don't go to set an appointment. I go to set a close and I'm doing it all on the doorstep. So I don't try to get into the homes, but I feel like to answer your question, having two people there, it makes it a lot more difficult. Okay. You know, and I guess the counter argument, Dwayne, to, to, you know, play the other side is that if, if somebody says, man, I just don't know if, if it's worth it, if, if me, because here's the thing that I think can be debated is yes, Dwayne, I hear you. I understand how effective it is, but it, I'm still not, even if the risk is 1%, 2%, to me, it's just not worth it to risk my life to go and make a sale. There's got to be a different way for me to go out there and build my business. What would you say to somebody that that maybe brings that argument? Well, I, I just ask them why they feel like they're going to risk, risk their life, number one. I mean, you got to look at these scenarios. The one was a car that drove into a, a backwoods road that had big private entrance signs all over it. The other one, they were knocking at 10 o'clock at night. Now, who in their right mind is going to go knock on a door to sell real estate at 10 o'clock at night? Now, I, I've, I've closed a lot of deals after 9 p.m. in the dark, but it's always set appointments. So you've got to work smarter. You've got to go mm, get during a great point. time, knock on the door and say, hey, you know, I'm tied up to come back in the next hour, but I can come back around 9 o'clock tonight. Does that work for you? Will your husband be home? Um, will, will your wife be home? Set appointments for after dark, but you shouldn't be out pounding doors at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. At trying to create fresh fresh business because it's just going to tick people off, number one, and it will put you in more danger. I mean, if someone comes banging on my door at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, I'm going to be sketched out too. I'm not going to shoot them through the door for Pete's sakes, but I'm going to be sketched out going, who in the world's banging on my door this late at night? Great point, Dwayne. You know, and yeah, when you read into these, this doesn't make it okay. I don't think you're saying it's okay, but when you read into the stories, you see that there was some context. There was some nuance to what had occurred. What you're saying is that agents that, you know, want to door knock, do it in the morning, do it in the afternoon, do it when it's bright outside. Um, maybe, you know, the agent, well, let me ask you rather, does an agent need to consider their appearance on how they dress to even increase even more safety you know, that you stand back from the door. Are, are there any best practices like that, Dwayne, that you recommend when you coach agents in door knocking? Great question. Brad, and I go over all this in my coaching program because there is so much that is involved in that. Your appearance matters more than, so than you'd ever guess. How you dress, what you look like, your stance at the door. I'm never going to have someone stand broad shouldered at the door. I want you at an angle. I want you less intimidating. I don't want you standing right next to the door. I want you four or five feet back or one step off the step mm -hmm. so that open the doors like, like, hey, this guy's coming into my house. It's, hey, I'm back. And then how your mannerisms are. I mean, you really, I don't carry a clipboard. I don't want papers. I don't want notepads. I don't want anything out. I want my hands completely open to where they can see my hands and they know that I'm not there in fact, they don't think I'm a salesman when they open the door. And I think that is key 
is they want to know, hey, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, Dwayne, this is great. I appreciate you jumping on the show today. I know it's a highly debatable topic. It's it's a it's 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 unfortunate that things like that happen, but when they when we bring those things into our industry, I think that we have to there are things to consider. Uh, and it's definitely worth us talking about to raise the awareness so that you know people are staying safe while building successful businesses. So, Dwayne, I appreciate you very much. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, so joining us again on the show, we, he is becoming our uh, favorite favorite guest, Mr. Steve Frost from National Mortgage Funding. Thanks for jumping back on to talk about a highly controversial topic, and that is the fact that the government, as of this week, have decided, or it appears as though, this is why we have you on the show, to penalize those that have been responsible, paid their bills on time, have a great credit score, and reward those who haven't that are looking to buy a house this year. So welcome back to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. What a so wonderful first, topic. Yeah, it is a How we very, get ripped off this week. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting. And the mainstream media is having a field day with this. But before we jump into the conversation, I want to share just a, a minute or two of a video from Meet Kevin, who I think does a really nice job framing this thing up for the audience, Steve. So let me share my screen and I want to show this first. Can you see this okay? Oh yeah. Well, good old Joe Biden and the Biden administration are now bringing affirmative action to real estate. Maybe not directly, but to some extent, yeah. There is now a new announcement out from the Biden administration that, listen to this, they are going to hike payments for good credit home buyers to subsidize higher risk, low income, minority borrowers. That's right. So if you've done right with your finances, you have a higher credit score and a higher down payment, you're now going to have to pay a higher monthly payment to subsidize people who just didn't operate their finances as well. On one side, people are arguing, hey, well, in fairness, maybe you had the better opportunity to go to a better school because you were in a minority. On the other side, people are like, F that, I worked my ass off to get where I am and I shouldn't have to subsidize somebody else. That's the government's job, not my job. Government shouldn't be making it more expensive for me to operate because somebody else didn't do as well. All right. So that kind of frames it up as to what's happening. Every media outlet right now has their own spin on essentially this um, information that was just released. So I know you had sent me some, some information, which we'll share with the audience in a few minutes. But Steve, what is your take on this? You know, unless it's something that there's like some new report other than what I think this is like the whole affirmative action spin on it and, and all that kind of stuff is like a ton of sensationalism. Honestly, um, what you're saying is that if you're a margin, like let's call it marginalized demographic or like a non white demographic, they're saying has bad credit, right. Is, is essentially what is how all that's coming across because what, I'm trying to think of a way to not get like too into the weeds and too technical, but what he was mentioning in there is something that we call an LLPA, right? Which is a loan level pricing adjustment. And so in mortgages, everybody talks about paying points, right? Isn't that like the number, this is a number one question people ask. They say like, all right, hey, you know, Bob, is that your name you use? Bob or Tom? Yep. Bob you know, your too. interest rate on your 30 year fixed is 6.375. Your cash payments, this cash goes. They're like, okay, how many points does that come with? So the number one question, so LLPA, which is what you're going to hear this a lot because this story is not going to go away, right? So an LLPA are points that every lender that does a conventional loan has to charge you for risk. And so there's like credit. It's like a, a matrix of credit score on a purchase transaction, right? So for a purchase transaction on a primary home, and I guess on, on any home, it's like how much you're borrowing and your credit score puts you into different buckets and you pay more. Should we show the buckets. audience? Yeah, you, you can if you want. Yeah. 
So, so, so why don't you walk us through what you're talking about, right? So, so right. on the screen right now, for people that are listening to this on the podcast, Steve, we're showing a matrix of people that have a certain credit score and the amount of risk associated points that are charged to that home buyer for the loan in which they get. And so why don't you walk us through what, what the audience is looking at? All right. So if you look at this, if you look at this matrix, right, there's ton, like, you'll see, there's like three pages of these. We're only focusing on this top one purchase money loan. This is somebody buying a house credit score and LTV. So LTV stands for loan to value. That's how much you're borrowing compared to the value of your home. So if you're buying a house and you put down, let's just say 10%, your LTV is 90% because you're, you owe 90% of the value of the house. That's that ratio that you're looking at right there. So just for perspective, this, these are what changed are all these numbers that you're currently highlighting, right? So let's just stay in that column where you're putting, this is saying you're putting down uh, between 5% down and 9.99% down, right? So you're not in the 10% down bucket, but either way, this, this is a great example. If you look at it, if you have a 743 credit score, right? So you go 740 to 759 and you go down, you're going to pay 0.625 points. So if you're borrowing $100,000, you're going to pay $625 in points or fees at closing for putting down 10% with that credit score. Okay. Now, now let me, let me jump in. So that makes sense and thanks for sharing the the uh the matrix it helps the audience to kind of art uh, uh right. visualize this what's changed why is this story such a big deal what you just said i'm with you i totally get it right is yep. that more than are, are people in fact that have better credit are they in fact being charged more now yes so last month or not last month so these these actually all came out in february so we've known about this for a while they're they're being implemented so these have actually been priced into loans since like early march and the main reason for that is because they have to be priced into the loan because they go into effect when those loans are sold to fannie mae and freddie mac may so first already, from my understanding yeah may first so anything that's bought by fannie mae or freddie mac after may first is subject to these so if you lock a rate april 15th your loan is already priced into that. As a matter of fact, if you locked a loan April 1st and your loan doesn't clo close until May 2nd, you're subject to these fees because Fannie Mae is buying that loan after May 1st. So all these fees have already been built into rates. But yeah, so before this, before this all happened, a 740 credit score with 10% uh, down would have cost you a quarter point. And so now it costs you five eighths of a point. So it's gone up $375 for every $100,000 that you borrow. And that's right, so they raise prices. The part that everybody's pissed off about is that if you go, if you go, if you have a 640 credit score, that might've cost you three and a half points. So if you go down to six, say you got a 642, right? Let's not go below 639, cause that's just like ugly country. Okay. So if you go six and you're doing that same loan, 90 to 90.01 to 95, you're paying 1.875 points. That was probably, in the past three and a half points to wow. do that loan. So they so, made that cheaper for those borrowers. But the the part of that that you have to understand is that when I get that borrower, they're not getting a conventional loan. Like mm. that that borrower is not doing a conventional loan. The, the approvals are much more to do five percent down with the six forty three credit score, it's really hard to get that loan approved. You're going FHA on that loan every time. So you know let me ask I mean? you this. Why are people why are why is the media making such a big deal about this? I mean, because you can, I guess, you know, so if you think about it, like it's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and FHFA, so Federal Housing Finance Administration governs those two things. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not the government. They're government sponsored entities, but those are companies that generate profit like that CEO of Fannie Mae gets a fat ass bonus when Fannie Mae makes more money than they are projected to make. My my opinion is that, yes, they're charging more to offset some risk, but where they improved the pricing was not a Fannie Mae loan. Those are not FHFA loans. I 
in my head, it, it looks more like they took the most common loans that they do at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They said, okay, most people that do these loans have 680 to 740 scores. They put between 5% and 15% down. We're going to increase the fees on that, on all those buckets. We're going to raise those fees everywhere. We're going to call it increase risk or ways to subsidize risk. All they're doing, in, in my opinion, is it's another way for them to make more money because that's their primary target. Like, well, there's, a, there, 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 there's an argument that's being made that, in fact, the government is taking from the people who have been more responsible, taking from the uh, the argument was, I saw another uh, article that was take from the rich, give to the poor. In fact, that because of what you just said, that the most common mortgage that is backed by Fannie Mae, we're going to take those mortgages, make those more expensive for the people that have been responsible with their life, their behaviors, that have paid bills on time, that have saved money. We're going to make it more expensive for those folks so that we can make it more affordable for those have been less responsible. That's the argument that's being made, is it not? Yeah, 100%. And I don't, and I don't look, I, I'm on the same side. Like, I don't like charging people that. I'm in the bucket, you know, like I have the good credit and the more money down, like I'm going to pay more too. But that, that lower end client is in the, the, the part of that the media is making look bad, right? Is saying that, like, if you have great credit and you've got all these things, you're going to pay more than somebody that's got worse credit. When if you look at those adjustments, that person that's got the worst credit is paying significantly more still. They're just paying less than they would have in the past. Right. Which in my opinion, you can call it Peter Panism, right? Robbing from the robbing from the rich and giving to the poor. Not you can Peter call Pan. It you mean you mean you mean Robin Hood. Is that who it is? I don't know. I suck it. I'm like I'm over here literally right now thinking about peanut butter. That was like that's as far as I go with Peter Pan. That's Robin but Hood. The, Steal from the rich, give to the poor. Yeah, Robin Hood. You got it. So you could, but I, for me, it's more of they're trying to dip into that less or maybe that like demarginalized pool of, of borrowers to get away from the FHA. If you notice, FHA came out this year and lowered their terms. They made FHA loans a lot more appealing than they did conventional loans. So I think this almost looks like a way to try to capture more of that lower end borrower. Um, from Fannie or from that FHA and bring them into Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Well, what it, what, it, what it also looks like is potentially the, the counter argument to the ones that feel as though people are getting penalized because they've been responsible. The counter argument to those folks is you're making home affordability or home ownership more of a possibility to more people the same way that the 1% down mortgage that we talked about on an episode earlier this week is doing. That's the right. counter argument. It says, why are you guys so upset? All this is doing is, to your point, making it more accessible for more people to buy homes. What's so wrong with that? That's essentially what you're saying. Right. And here's here's another piece of this, too, is that, again, and this goes back to being uh, a creative loan officer, but if those... All those LPAs that you see there, if you make less than 120% of the area median income. So yesterday we were talking about 50% or less, you get 1% down. If you make less than 120% of the area median income, you can get, you get to waive all those LLPAs if you're mm. a first time home buyer. If you make less than 100% of the area, or if you make less than the 80% of the area median income, you don't pay any of those LLPAs, great credit or bad credit, doesn't matter. Interesting. If you are a first time home buyer and you make less than 100% of the area median income, you don't pay any of those LLPAs. There's a ton of incentives out there. And look, a seventy, a $72,000 income that in my market, right? That's 80%, $6,250 or that's $72,000 a year, $6,250 a month. I can get you a $3,000 mortgage payment not saying we max everybody out, but you just use one borrower's income. And there's ways around a lot of those fees, which is getting away from the topic here, which is, are we are we playing Robin Hood or not? And yeah, probably. And, and you know, it's, it's not, you always say like, it's not fair, right? But I, I look at it the same way, like the price of a Cadillac Escalade is up like $16,000, right? Like, and you can't negotiate. You cannot negotiate a, the price of a Cadillac Escalade. If you're like, hey, I would like, I'm totally into the Escalade. If you can do it for 1400 a month, they're like, 
Oh, are you almost done here? Because the next guy that wants it's on his way in. You know, like yeah. they don't yeah. care. But if you do that on a Chevy Equinox, they're like, yeah, I got 14 of them on the lot. Let's work on your payment, like the cheaper car, and you can get a better deal on it. You know, it's like, a, a, I don't know. I don't even know if that makes sense. That was just on my mind. Yeah, no, I pre it makes it does make sense. And uh, Steve, we appreciate your commentary like always.